Sarah, you know, top of the, the funnel, when you're looking at deals, I'm sure you get approached quite a bit. What are some red flags that you look at and what are you looking to avoid in an acquisition? I don't like seeing debt. Mm-hmm. I don't like seeing businesses that have debt in the books already. Um, and uh, I mean, even though we have a bit of debt in a crew that we took on for acquisition purposes, um, for a lot of these businesses, they haven't grown by acquisition. They've grown organically. So if their debt ratios are high, like debt to earnings ratios, I get nervous right? Anything more than a four to one uh, debt to earnings ratio is a flag. So if they can't pay back their debt based on four years of their earnings, there's a flag there. So a bit of debt's okay, but if they're breaking that four to one uh, ratio of earnings, like their earnings, not our earnings after we normalize them, their earnings, there's like, ooh. So that means they've already taken on a bit too much debt. So that's mm-hmm. that's a big flag that we see. Um, and then, obvi- then it's the other obvious metrics, right? It's, are they even growing? Where are they getting attrition and why? right? You know, where are they losing customers? Where are they winning customers, right? And if, if they are winning, is that repeatable, right? If they are losing, is that probably repeatable too? So it's understanding the winning and losing in the middle of that as well as the other kind of major stakes that we kind of look at for each piece. Super cool. So the debt itself, I mean, are you typically absorbing that? Are you buying it out? Are you... Uh, yeah, like, well, like we always want to clear it right away. I mean, okay. most of our deals, like it's just, I, it's only now we're looking at deals that even have debt in them. Up until now, none of them had debt. Right, we did, we did all asset purchases. So we just said, even if you've got debt, we're doing an asset purchase. So your debt's on you, you take it out of your consideration, right? So they all had different varying levels of debt, but we did asset purchases. Our last year was the first time we did a share purchase. And we have other share purchases in front of us. When you do a share purchase, that's the other caution flag. You're taking on skeletons and closets. You're taking on old debts and all that good stuff. So you gotta be careful. If anything, you should be discounting your deals a little bit uh, if you're gonna do share purchases because there is that risk. The sellers love it, right? Because they get to do a little bit less taxes. For oh, from there. get, there's, yeah. there's the capital gains exemption that they get. They get to wash their right. hands. A bit. Great for the seller. Not the best for the buyer. Ideally, if as a buyer, if you do an asset acquisition, it's, it's, it's always the, pre- the preference. And of our 10 deals, nine were asset. Only one was uh, share purchase. Right. And are you guys typically doing all cash? Or I know you mentioned a little bit, you, you roll up a little of uh, equity and give them stock options, I think, which, which a lot of sellers maybe think about when they're they're selling is, um, you know, how much, how much shares am I getting of the, of the new business? And you know, how does my, my long-term incentive play with the, with the strategic acquirer? Yeah, like early on, shares are what we have, right? And, and the story was, hey, if we combined our business, your revenues were 20% of the total business, why don't you take 20% of the equity? 20% in the crew is better than 100% of you, right? Mm-hmm. And that's kind of how deals got done. Um, but as time's gone on, we don't want to do that anymore. We don't want to keep, you know, diluting our shareholders with that whole model, right? Because we're past that inflection point of growth and, and, and profits and all that good stuff. But, but you do like a bit of equity in there and, and we've been paying in cash. So how do you inject a bit of equity without dilution, right? And so do you do just 10 or 20% of it being equity? So they have a little bit of skin in the game, but there's also upside for them. If the stock performs, it's a great win for them, right? We have deals right. that one of our largest stock deals, the deal was done at five cents. He's still sitting on half of his shares. They're up 600%. Mm. he's pretty happy and he's ha- he's going to keep sitting on it for another few years he's like ah, i'm going to keep sitting on this and letting it ride so for him it was a great deal for him right so there's a value that maybe convertible debt is something in the future where they have a guarantee to cash or they can convert it to equity right um so i do like the idea of some type of equity twist in there in some component so there's a little bit of extra commitment to the business um but also if we can just clear a deal in cash that's not a bad thing either yeah, and I think one interesting point that uh, I think a lot of uh, sellers are always interested in is how strategics look at it. If they're looking at it from your shoes, if they're sitting in your perspective and how they're looking at it, if you're a publicly traded companies, you guys are currently trading, I think we talked before the show, at about 5x uh, a revenue. Now, how, how does that affect? So if I'm looking at a business and I'm looking to pay, let's call it two and a half x the revenue. Now you're absorbing that revenue that you're paying basically half the, the valuation of what you're worth today. How do, how do you look at that in terms of how that affects your valuation and how, sh- uh, how can you explain that to, to make it make sense for them? Yeah. So at a high level, I mean, we're in the public markets, mind you, right? So, right. so we're a public business. We're seeing a four to five multiple right now, um, which you see, right? You see 10 times multiples in the public markets, right? Because of growth projectiles, the industry you're in strategy, strategically, you know, you have a good mode around your business, all that good stuff. Um, so it's not uncommon to see even our current valuation, if not much more, than what we have, right? Um, but in, in the private world, um, 
one, we don't want to be buying more than we're trading for. But secondly, you want to buy where you can have recouped pretty quickly. So we've been paying pretty much two times revenue. Two and a half was the most we've ever paid because we can only really rip out half the costs. We don't want to take more than five years to pay back our investment. So obviously there's growth and you're expecting there's a growth business there too, but we don't want to pay taking five or 10 years to, to get a payback, right? There's intrinsic value, but that's why you're only seeing the two to two and a half times. So even if we were trading at two times, even if we're trading at 10 times, I don't think it's always wise to be paying more than that two to three times anyways. Um, it's got to be super strategic for you to pay more than that because just the payback. Even if we were trading at 30 times revenue right now, it would mean that I'd be saying, yeah, we should do pay 20 times. That, that I just feel differently that, that the fair value is that two to three times in the private markets because of what we have to do. We see a premium in the public markets because of scale, investor awareness and the direction of the company, access to capital. You have way more means than the private company, way more means. So that's why you get the appreciation in the markets. Yeah, absolutely agree. And that's kind of the similar valuation of what we're paying at Horizon. And um, I think up until you get to the 5 million kind of ARR mark, I don't think you can you know, ask for a lot more until, you know. Well, that's the other thing too. So our yeah. sweet spot's less than $5 million annual businesses, so smaller than where we are. No right. one's really buying down there and you're certainly not seeing big multiples down there, right? right. All the big yeah. multiples are the, you know, your, your $100 million plus companies, like your, your mid to large cap companies are where you see the big, big multiples, right? For the small micro cap, nano cap kind of business, size business, um, you're not seeing the big multiples there either. So there's not a lot of buyers, but there is lots of sellers. Right? There's a right. supply and demand thing going on there. Um, not a lot of guys, I guess, that'll buy a business that does hundred thousand dollars revenue, right, or a million dollars revenue, right? But we have done it and, and do do them. Hmm. In terms of that that kind of strategy, in terms of your growth strategy, we talk about you know organic versus inorganic growth. Um, you know, a lot of your focus has been in, on the inorganic side, which is the, the acquisition plays. How do you kind of make that balance in decision making of you know why this is the best strategy for Acru versus you know uh, just focusing on on one or the other? So there's two things. That, to answer that. So the first is that organically, it's been stunted because you're so much focused on inorganic. If your whole business, if at Horizon, you're so focused on inorganic, it's going to be hard to really drive your organic business, right? Because you're normalizing, right. you're negotiating deals, you're creating aware, like there's a lot of work there. And when you're small, you only have so many staff, you can only do one thing really well. It's hard to do two things really well. Right. As you get bigger, you can kind of divide and conquer a little bit, right? And that's kind of where we're getting to. We're getting to a, a critical mass where you can divide and conquer a little bit. But on the organic side, what you got to get really good at is the cross sell upsell. If you're a business like ours, that's buying complementary offerings or competitive offerings and primarily on the complementary side, you've got to be really good at cross sell upsell because yes, you buy a business at two or three times revenue and so you can maintain and maybe grow it. But where your really big intrinsic value comes is if you can actually double that, take that hundred dollar a month guy to two or $300 a month um, because you can cross sell products and services. So suddenly there's three times the value and the payback is so fast. So, so when you're, when you're acquiring the complimentary, for me, I just believe it strongly and you've got to get really strong and really good at the cross sell upsell. And that's a path to huge returns for, for you and your business. hundred percent. Yeah. I love that strategy. Um, and then, you know, so that's a good strategy that that's worked for you. Can you share any growth strategies that maybe you've tested and ran that hasn't worked as well, or, or maybe called, you know, failed for Acru? Yeah. So I, I don't mind storytelling. So one of the acquisitions we did, we bought, um, and it ties, or it's funny, everything, you, all the stories tied to both, unfortunately, but we bought a, an automotive business called Dealer Rewards years ago. And we we're excited about Dealer Rewards, um, not because we got some dealer customers and automotive that we have some specialization in, but they sold a lot of marketing services, which was a lot of like email and direct mail marketing. We're like, oh, well, this is great. Email and direct mail marketing. It's the services component is a great complement to our product, you know, product and services. They kind of go well together. But what we learned over time was the email marketing was great for us because over time, we can innovate into our technology, right? It can become a part of our product. So even if we sold less of it, it becomes a part of the product, right? And the opposite's happened. Digital marketing has grown because of the digital economy and what have you. But like fundamentally, even if it didn't, the support cost would be so low because we just have the tech do it. Mm. On the direct mail side, it is still very manual intensive and, and expensive. So never mind the market doing less and less direct mail because nobody wants to touch a mail piece or whatever. Um, but like in the cost of it is high, better to do everything digital. So never mind that, but it's very operational heavy. But I can never make direct mail be a part of our tech. So for me, as a tech first company, services second business, again, right. it depends what your business is. If your service can't become your tech, don't offer that as a service. Mm. So if your service can't become your tech, I think that has to be another golden rule that you follow. If you're a tech company, if your services right. company doesn't Right? But if you're a tech company first, you don't want to take on services that can't become your tech because what you're, right. you're supposed to be a tech company. So don't take on services that can never become your tech because it'll always just be a service and it could eventually become a drain. 